Okay, hello and good morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, December 13th. Michael Boutros here for this live intraday strategy webinar on SB Trade Desk. Good to be with you guys here this morning. D, Eileen, Conwall, Horace, Mark, Steve, uh, welcome aboard. So, we are heading into the FOMC. If you're with me for yesterday's webinar on daily effects, I'm sorry we had some audio issues. If you guys experience any issues here, which you shouldn't, but if you do, uh, please feel free to stop me at any time. So, um, markets are continuing to rip higher. Dollar index is continuing to hold below key resistance that we highlighted earlier in the week. We'll go over the dollar crosses. I'm going to leave the FOMC stuff till tomorrow, guys. If you have any specific questions that you want to address, obviously, uh, feel free to throw them out. Tomorrow, we'll do a quick review um, of where the dot plots were, were as far as the expectations. Again, growth, interest rates, inflation, uh, unemployment. We'll go over the whole nine yards in the statement of what we should expect before that release. That being said, we want to go over the quick sterling crosses. Sterling is a big week of data. We did get CPI numbers in overnight trade, stronger than expected. Uh, we'll look at pound dollar, pound yen. Dollar yen, euro yen are also on the menu. And I also had a Kiwi cat update in there. Haven't operated on that yet, but I'm definitely uh, kind of stalking that for entry right now. We'll go over setups on the dollar CAD, uh, which levels remain unchanged, but still looking for that drop in support and Aussie dollar. As always, guys, any questions, trade setups you want to throw down, uh, feel free. Hi, Mike. Hi, everyone in the room. Says Amir. Good morning to you, buddy. He says, I'm not uh, buying this rally on the Dow and the S&P. What is a good entry for short? For medium term trade would be so Amir I'm gonna write those down I don't really intraday trade to be quite honest with you um, the Dow or the S&P it's been years for me but we'll definitely take a look at some near-term price action see if we can't figure it out for you okay Kiwi says D uh, that's not on the list well it is now <laughs> Kiwi dollar gotcha all right Okay, let's jump right in. So before we get started, uh, dollar index, here's what it looks like. Uh, if you guys recall on the intraday page, I did update the radar charts last night or um, earlier in the week. This was where we opened on Sunday, okay? The high day close, the 88.6 retracement, 101.75, 101.70 is exactly what caught the high. We made an outside reversal, okay? Outside day reversal off that mark yesterday, which again reaffirms the risk for near-term weakness in the pair, okay? The broader story for the dollar still remains constructive, guys, but the risk heading into the FOMC is paramount. Why? Because of what we're expecting as far as interest rates from the Fed. It's not so much that they're, and you're gonna hear me hammer this in until tomorrow, guys. It's not so much that we're expecting the hike, that's priced in. Point in fact is the markets have already priced in two hikes for 2017. Uh, the question is, does that two hike expectation move? Guys, to keep things in perspective, this is only the second interest rate hike in 10 years. Believe it or not, uh, that we haven't been zero at 10 years, but this is the first, only the second time that they've actually moved to raise interest rates in 10 years. So certainly um, that's priced in. It's the expectation of how quick that's going to go from here on out. So um, quick look. I showed you this earlier in the week as well. World interest rate probabilities. Here's what the Fed fund futures are still pricing in. Um, and I've highlighted this on the update from Sunday. What I just wanted to show you is this. To calculate the subsequent expectations for hikes, guys, you have to add these two columns. So 92%, basically we're at 100% chance for a hike uh, this time around. Heading into February, Okay, we'll be in this range from 7.5 to 1%, from 0.75 to 1% rather. And you can see here for February, you're only looking at about a 14, per, not even, 12% expectation and so forth. The first material expectation, meaning above 50%, doesn't come into June. And at June, you're looking at 45, uh, almost 60%, okay, uh, chance for a hike from the Fed. If this starts to sneak higher, you can see we're about the same from where we were um, on Sunday. If this starts to sneak higher, 
look for the dollar to really remain well supported. That means markets are expecting that the Fed is going to accelerate that glide slope is of interest rate in, uh, uh, hikes. Uh, if that starts to deteriorate or you see them come out with a little bit uh, more of a dovish statement, a little bit more of a, a reserved approach because of what's going on in Europe and uh, new policy or if they even mention uh, the risk that the election or the new administration would, would pose, uh, then you'd look for those interest rate expectations to be kicked out. Don't want to beat a dead horse. It is what it is. We'll update this again, again tomorrow, uh, obviously ahead of the FOMC. But just something to keep in mind as far as what our expectations are for interest rates or for the Fed tomorrow. Um, so for the dollar index, again, you're at risk while below 101.75, 101.70. I don't want to get too excited on the short side. As I said, you know, it's not outside the realm possibility to get some sort of washout. You get a hike with some, uh, you know, hawkish commentary in the beginning. You see a nice spike into this median line before reversing. So. As far as the dollar crosses are concerned, as a disclaimer, I'm flat. I've been trying to get, I think I just missed it, gosh darn it, in pound yen. I've been trying to get on the short side of pound yen still. Um, I ate a stop on it last night, but we hit, we were right back up into structural resistance, so we'll take a look at that in a moment. Uh, but for the dollar crosses, stay nimble, guys. It doesn't pay to get really aggressive here on the dollar just yet. We're likely to get some really nice volatility. Uh, into tomorrow. In fact, to address D's question, D earlier in the session said, good morning, Michael. Hope uh, there's no sound issues today. Um, I think we all need to close down for the for the festive season. And D, no one looks forward to that more than me, but where opportunity dwells, that's where I'll be knocking. And right now, I still think you have uh, the FOMC, you have the BOE into the end of the week. Next week might be a little bit more stale, uh, we'll call it, but you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Any questions on the dollar index before we move off? Near-term support, look for that slope right there, again, that we've been following um, off the highs from back in April, okay? Same region of support that we rebounded off of. Critical support and what would suggest a much deeper corrections underway, you know, it's all the way down at the yearly open, 98.69. So right now, all this thing has done is set a pretty clear and well-defined monthly opening range. I was looking at this earlier. I don't really want to stress this, but there is a slope here I was checking out that could be in play. It gives you near-term support right around that 100 spot 15, 100 spot 10. And point in fact is if you make an extension, we'll do a little drill with you here off that move. Just lower is the 100% extension, 99.16. And that lines up pretty well with those former swing highs. So you got clear levels. I just want to see a little bit more of a, of a concerted drop to the downside. Keep in mind your monthly open just offered some resistance on this rally, although Friday we, we did push through it. Here's the Sunday open, quickly taking it back right below the monthly open. So we'll continue to favor the downside while below that region near term in the index. Um, is there a runaway gap just above 99, says D? Yeah, you know, I don't tend to really get too excited about those because it's been covered, it's been checked. Um, might be a decent pivot level below 99. I wouldn't say anything that's above 99 really is too convincing for me right now. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, you're looking at this gap. Whoops, a breakaway gap, right, yes. You're absolutely correct. I stand corrected, D. Yeah, that would give you – you need to get a move into this region here. <clears throat> Not bad. Now you're pushing this way out in time. This is like late, late in the month, post Christmas. Um, so again, I don't, I don't want to stress this slope guys, but that level does seem pretty good on a fill of that gap for sure. 
Um, here's the thing I want to say about gaps. D. D's asking, we should at some stage fill this gap. So here's the thing. Gap trading, let me take a step back. I've seen gaps play in both ways. Okay, there are some things called breakaway gaps, which is this, which is you're literally checking resistance or checking support, and the gap breaks away. You never get a pullback. And then there's just the Sunday open gap, which typically is, is filled within that week. Here's another Sunday open gap. We ra ramped up, filled it within that week. Um, breakaway gaps can take months, years to fill. Okay, there are gaps that don't ever fill. So I, I get concerned when our reasoning our, our uh, sort of the evidence that we want to take the trade is based on, oh, well, we have to fill that gap. We don't always have to fill the gap. Uh, again, I personally think that we will at this point in dollar index just because I, I do like a turn lower. In fact, if you look at some of the analogs that Jamie posted yesterday, uh, it's kind of about time, you know, even from a, a timing standpoint where we could start to see that materialize. So um, it's great for marking targets, D. It's great for marking areas of resistance or support when they converge on key levels, but we don't always need to fill the gap, no. You can go back in time and find gaps that essentially never got filled. Here I think we get it though. Here I think we get it. And it's different from just a Sunday open gap. The breakaway gap, which again, breaks above a resistance level and keeps going, those tend to be fueled. Here's a gap that filled just within a couple of hours. You know what I mean? A lot of these gaps are pretty quick to fill. Uh, another one is one in crude. In fact, D, if you want to you know, keep that theme going, guys, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll digress real quick. Dollar index was number one. Uh, we'll just do crude real quick. That'll be number two. Uh, and the only reason I want to bring this up is because it's the same exact scenario, right? In fact, in this one, I do think it fills. Um, again, if we take a quick look back at the daily chart in crude, very simple, just basic crude trend lines. <laughs> Uh, trend line support mimicked off the high really nice levels here you did run through it but it was on a gap and you closed well below on that session to fill that gap would require a move back into former resistance so this is a breakaway it doesn't necessarily need to fill it's just that from a trading standpoint look where that support is as well the lower parallel June high 1618 extension and the former 2016 high day close. We've obviously made a new high now, but definitely a region of which price has found some significant, significant resistance, right? So we'll see. Bottom line, if crude breaks back below 1550, I do think you make a run back towards that 5160, 5165 range, and that would be an area of which it starts to look for a little, a little bit more rigid, uh, rigid support. But you want to see the inherent market turn and want to try to fill that gap right off the bat. If it was a breakaway gap and this thing had just run north of 55 from here, you know, that breakaway for me at that point doesn't really hold too much, uh, too much credence. D, does that make sense? Interesting co uh, combo on, the, on, on gaps for sure. It says, oh, okay, thanks. You're more than welcome. All right, let's jump into uh, yesterday's update on the Sterling crosses. <clears throat> So, here's the pound last night, here's the pound now. Uh, we got stronger than expected uh, CPI figures. It's a big week, like I said, for the pound. You still have unemployment data on tap tomorrow. Um, uh, you have, obviously, the Fed uh, also, and then we have the BOE on Thursday. So this thing is still loaded up. Pound probably has the biggest event risk combo this week. Nice little reversal here in pound yen might get us back in. Uh, but here's what the pound dollar looks like from last night. So we were coming into initial resistance. If you remember from the Sunday update, let's take you back one more day here. Um, we started off the week just above this support. Now, ideally, and what we were talking about on Sunday is to look for a dip lower to get long. Um, obviously, you didn't really get a move too much lower, right? It kind of held that ground and ran right through. So 26.95, 26.24 was the first interim resistance level, 26.95 was bearish invalidation, that's this region here. And last night we made a failed attempt, 
And I said again, if we break through this, you're essentially looking for a rally towards 27.67. You're getting that now. Here's what it looked like last night. And here's what looks like to me a pretty decent break. So 26, or excuse me, 27.67 is a critical region of resistance. And here's why. Look at the daily chart. Remember that 1985 slope? We talked about this earlier in the week, extending off the low from 1985. This is just basic slope resistance. Okay, that level converges on the 100-day moving average. And the swing lows from, what is that, July? 27.98 into 27.70, let's call it. Big area of resistance. Big area of resistance. So that's sort of the next top side level I think you look for on this stretch. It also coincides, interestingly enough, with last week's high. So it kind of makes sense just from a basic high-low range. Um, and that's the region you need to crack that really, I think, gives this thing legs. I do like the pound higher. Again, kicking myself because I'm not in this specific trade. But, um, you know, keep that region in focus. You could see a reaction off this level to kick this lower. And especially if the dollar rallies tomorrow from a timing standpoint, it'd be an area of which you'd expect to see maybe a little bit dollar a blow off in the dollar. And then a setback here would get us another opportunity to possibly take a long here on pound. I like it, though. There's nothing really, um, no change to any of those levels from yesterday. Any questions on the sterling? Here's what the CPI numbers look like. <clears throat> so this is just the month-on-month -month CPI numbers, or uh, excuse me, the, the monthly report. It's on your quarterly in inflation report, which is uh, not until next year. But um, zero, what is that, 1.2 versus 1.1. Core, 1.4, strip out food and energy versus 1.3. That's a nice 0.2% uptick from the previous month. Okay, heading into tomorrow, you have the claimant count. Jobless claims expect to come in at 6.5 thousand. It's a nice downtick from 9.8. ILO, three-month unemployment expected to hold at 4.8%, and supposed to see a gain, three-month, quarter-on-quarter gain of 50,000 jobs. Retail sales, obviously, will probably be a wash right ahead of the Bank of England, which comes out the following day. We are expecting them to hold at 0.25% asset purchases unchanged. Questions on British pound. That's number three. Number four is pound yen, and this is the one I've been a little bit more active in. Much wider range trade. Um, Eileen saying, so after the prince, where to watch for sterling to go long again? So the levels are unchanged, Eileen. If we get, a, depending on where the price is, right? If we're into this region and we get the reaction to the downside, I'd be looking at former slope resistance, now support, somewhere just below 2770, uh, 2780, this region, to get back on the long side. Ideally, if we just collapse from here and this falls out, turns out to be a false break scenario, same level that I, that I was looking at earlier in the week, right down to 25, 25, 13. That's still sort of the butter zone I was looking for earlier that we never got into. Basic trend line support off that October low. Some nice FIB levels up there too. In fact, guys, I need to revise that. That 100% extension has no meaning at this point. We've broken that high, so it's a good thing you asked. Go ahead and revise that region there. And l l let me correct that by one, one level, uh, Eileen. The initial region you would look for is just the basic weekly opening range low, okay, which comes just above last week's low. So that's like 25.50, 25.13 would still be sort of what would shift the opinion in my mind. Keep in mind the monthly open is right there at 25.08. So... couple of reasons to be looking down there. Yeah. Um, Eileen's saying, okay, so uh, those were supports, but also near the upper uh, ML. Exactly. 
First initial support would be right here. If that breaks, I'd look for a deeper drop. To be quite frank with you, depending on what's happening with the dollar, that might be a decent short position. Um, if you do see a, a significant dollar rally tomorrow, if they come out pretty hawkish. But even on that short, I'd be looking to close that around this region, the monthly open, channel support or trend line support rather, 38.2. This is a region where I'd start to look to close out that position possibly for, for longs. You know, it's the event risk trade, Eileen, right? It really depends on where price is at that point. But the idea is you want to stay constructive above 25, basically above the monthly open. Make sense? <clears throat> okay. Um, sterling yen. So this is a little bit more of a risky trade. Um, as I always note whenever I'm talking about this trade, if you're newer to trading near-term uh, strategies, this is probably not what you want to get you know, tangled up with early on, but uh, the opportunity is definitely there. Big, big region of resistance from a structural standpoint. You know, We've been following the confines of this ascending median line formation off the lows. It's been pretty fruitful. Uh, the 618% uh, percent line uh, of that median line formation caught the lows for the monthly opening range low. Uh, now the monthly open converges on a 200-day moving average. That 618 line, uh, the highs from July. Um, you know, there's so much there to look at at that key support, and we vaulted off. Here we are at resistance again. <clears throat> Excuse me. I did see a short-term uh, trigger in price at the start of Asia trade. I tried to take a position against the Asia high. That didn't work. It broke through. Uh, but we're kind of coming into that same level of resistance again. Okay. Now, I might be trying to call the turn here, and I might be a little bit pre premature. Um, and I recognize that, which is why all these positions that I'm you know, messing with on the pound yen are literally, guys, some of them are, are, are less than a, a tenth of what I would normally trade. But just because we are at such critical levels, you're getting ongoing divergence into the highs. At the end of the day, if this thing continues higher, it's going to pop near 151.90, in my humble expectation. Um, it's kind of coiled right up into resistance. So if it's going to turn, you know, we should be looking of... We should be looking at signs of exhaustion up here. And that's what I'm looking at right now. Here's what the five and one minute chart looks like on the pound yen. Um, and again, you're seeing ongoing divergence into those highs. This is price action pushes that high. You saw it hold here. Even on the near term chart, the one minute chart, um, there was actually a really nice opportunity to try to take that short earlier today ahead of, uh, what was that, it's about 7.30. Um, but Coulda, woulda, shoulda, hindsight's always 20, 20. At the end of the day, I st still think you're at risk. Look for an objective break of the weekly opening range. Uh, the weekly opening range low, interestingly enough, right now comes in right along with the month, with the weekly open, right around here, around 45.08. So that'd be sort of the initial downside target. Secondary downside target would be here, which is the monthly open and that 618 line we talked about in the daily chart. Um, Again, I'm just recognizing that the risk is there. It's pound yen, guys. I wouldn't, you know, any yen cross, the blow-offs on those trades tend to be explosive. Um, and especially on a, pound, on a pair like pound yen, that blow-off could be like 200 pips to the upside than a reversal. So I always want to approach this with a little bit more care, be very nimble on the way in and out, recognizing the risk for a turn lower near term. But at the end of the day, on a, on a more substantiated pullback, be much more just in taking a long position here on pound yen. It's just that we're at resistance. I can't, I mean, I can't, from here, I can't get excited about any type of long exposure unless there's a clear definitive break of this region. No resistance at the 147 area? Uh, there would be, yeah. I mean, I, again, I wouldn't necessarily want to take a short if I had a long position on into 140, wouldn't even say 147, way above 147 here. We talked about this yesterday. It was around 148.30. Now that you're moving in time along this slope, I'd start to look at like 148.15, 148.20. It'd be an area of definitely of which I take some off the table, bring my stops to break even or even better. But I do think inevitably you'll see a stretch into 151.95 if this gives out. Here's what this line is, by the way, in red, guys. It's this on the daily chart. 
basic trend line resistance extending off the highs from 2015, specifically August and November. Take that same slope parallel off the lows from September. You did see it sail through a couple times earlier this year, but it caught resistance real nice. Take that same parallel off the low, opening range low of 2016. It caught the February and April lows again to the tick was the origin of the break. So yeah, you could get a reaction off that region, but like I said, it's been kind of messy along that, so more of an area I'd be looking to take some off the table necessarily than enter a new short position. Does that make sense, Amir? Look, at the end of the day, we're heading into the Fed and the BOE, so the you know, likelihood for uh, some serious volatility in price action could definitely take this well past 48 um, on, a, on a spike higher than reverse. But the point is recognizing the condition and looking at this from a weekly standpoint is also another reason that has me a little concerned. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This would be the ninth consecutive week of advances for pound yen. Okay, we have seen stretches like that before. Okay, in fact, not so long ago. Two, three, four. This was a 10 week stretch. Of course, it led inevitably to the high and the, and the virtual collapse. Here's a seven week stretch, right? So just recognizing the fact that, yeah, we have seen these prolonged times of pound yen, uh, both weakness and strength persist for over a month, no problem. Um, but just recognizing that when those reversals happen, it's not typically a nice rounded high, right? It's typically a pretty mean pullback um, of a couple thousand pips on this thing. So just recognizing again where we are near term. Questions on pound yen? Popular trade. You're the ones. You guys are the ones who got me really interested in this with uh, with the questions on this every day. So <laughs> kind of hooked near term, but uh, certainly coming at some interesting levels here. Okay, that's pound yen, number four. Number five, dollar yen. Uh, very similar scenario. I don't want to encourage you guys to get too uh, you know, aggressive on trying to call these turns, but certainly uh, it's been in lockstep with our expectations as far as dollar yen is concerned. Here's dollar yen. Oh, here's pound yen from yesterday, guys. No change, right? Uh, so that stays the same. Uh, dollar yen, you know, we talked about this again earlier in uh, – the week here was the Sunday update. We literally were saying 116.08 is you know kind of the upper end of that region of resistance that extends from 115.50 into 116.08. 115.48 being the 618 retracement, uh, long term key retracement. 116.08 um, being a pair of swing lows in price, not just extending back to the 2015 calendar year, but even further back this whole range has been such a critical range of resistance. So, I mean, picture perfect, right? This thing came right into 116.08. We saw some weakness yesterday. It didn't really give us much conviction as far as like a run reversal against, uh, but I still like it. I still like it. It's dollar yen. There's a reason I call it the abomination. This thing could spike into 118, then reverse. <laughs> but largely speaking, um, you want to be looking lower from here. Uh, again, the daily chart's pretty much more the definitive factor here. This is the same parallel of this formation. Whoops, don't want to mess with that. Okay. Converges on the August 2015 low. Now, daily divergence is still above 70, or daily divergence, excuse me, daily momentum is still above 70. You did mark divergence on all three of those highs. Okay, but these signals above 70 tend to be your weakest. So I don't want to stress that as, as the reasoning I want to be bearish. More so just from a critical zone of resistance, critical pivot zone, um, you know, slope resistance. If it's going to turn, this is a good area. Near-term support, look at the monthly open, 114.43 or so. Um, taking this into the near-term charts, a little bit clearer. 
in 14.43. Key support 113.15. That's last week's lows here. Former median line resistance converges just lower. So let this thing range. I think you got a pretty decent weekly opening range. As always, when the weekly opening range takes shape below key resistance or key support, those are our best plays. So you know definitively 116.08, basically the highs that we made, you want to kind of keep this range in focus as resistance. I'm looking against it to the downside. If it pops through higher, don't want to touch it. It could head into 118. It could head into 119.40. If you want to be nimble on the buys in such a scenario, I'd be fine with that. But you do not want to try to fade this thing uh, if it gets too aggressive with a break above 116.08. It's really kind of, a, in my mind, a big zone, a big zone. Even the next sort of more important swing lows still takes you into 118. So just keep that in view here for dollar yen. Questions? Eileen, are you saying pound yen because something's happening here? Or are you saying pound yen because... Yeah, hopefully it gives us a little bit of a rebound again. because I missed that entire thing. Keep in mind, quarter, quarter of the daily ATR is 53 pips. I asked how tight you took the stops on pound yen. Oh, Eileen, it's right here. I'll show it to you. I got nothing to hide. <laughs> it's right here. Uh, it was a 26 pip stop. So at the start of, um, and this is a good drill to always kind of go through for those of you who might be newer or kind of just guessing how we go through these daily setups. Um, the way I played it was you had the open of Sydney trade set in an opening range from here, which was basically 145.85. Uh, uh, then this thing ducked into 145, uh, 145.50, 145.40. So it gave you basically like a 30 pip range. And I wanted to take a stop against that high. Once I got a near term trigger to the downside, it was this break here. If I'm not mistaken, that I was looking at. Three point trigger break. And kind of jumped into the position. I put a stop against the opening range high, which allotted me, um, like I said, about 26 pips. Now, that got stopped out on the, on the rip higher. But, you know, the profit target, the initial profit would have been about 53 pips um, on the gain. So it was a decent setup if it would have panned out. But, again, a little premature, I think. And this is the way it is on calling these turns, guys. And, again, you know, I never even want to say that I'm calling the turn. I'm just trying to recognize the fact where we have the potential for further weakness off of a resistance level. Um, now you're at an even higher mark. You're still within the confines of this formation, and you're still butting up against resistance. So for me, I'm still in the same exact mode. So are you looking for about one-eighth of the ATR on the wider cross? It's not necessarily, again, Eileen, remember what I always stress to you, right? It's not necessarily the a quarter of the ATR is just a gauge of where you want to be looking for profits. The stop is always based on the, technicals level, on the technical levels. If the stop is less, if the next technical level is less than 53 pips, well, that's a, a feasible trade. If the stop, the technical level is more than 53 pips, then I can't. I never want to take the ATR into my account when I'm taking the stop. The stop is something that's completely objective. If this level is invalidated, that changes my bias. I can't change that based on what the ATR is doing, right? So um, the reason that that stop there yesterday was only 26 pips was because that's what the opening range high for Sydney was. That's all. And it was less than 53 pips, so it was a feasible trade. I had a decent trigger. Go for it. And it's a good thing because that worked out pretty well, right? A lot of people would see a stop like this and say, oh, man, that hurt 26 pips. No, because A, the gain would have been much larger. And B, market rallied more than 100 pips to the upside. So, yes, I'm happy taking a 26 pip stop. No big deal. Make sense? Yes, stops uh, for tech areas for sure. Just need closer watching and slash better entries. Yep. And you'll get it. And you'll get it. Uh, makes sense, says Eileen. Awesome. What's the seasonal 
um, direction for dollar yen for December Horus Horus so you can always check out the seasonalities on uh, the long-term charts page if you click on long-term charts guys seasonality charts excuse me seasonality charts are right here let's take a look here's dollar yen seasonality so point in fact you can actually still see seasonal seasonals don't get that bearish actually seasonality is for the dollar and again these here's what I want to say obviously each environment is going to be different based on what the market conditions are doing but if you take a look at Jamie's swing update from yesterday here's the interesting thing I'm looking at this is post 2000 election okay the analog has a drift lower we're basically on this rebound here so heading into the start of the new year there's been some serious analogs of some weakness continued here for the dollar. Not necessarily versus the yen, per se, Horus. And I don't want to take a short... Let me correct myself here, guys. Let me just clarify something. When we're talking about things like pound-yen at resistance, things like dollar-yen at resistance, I'm talking to you guys from a near-term trader, a guy who's trying to play a rebound against resistance. Um, these are still very strong uptrends, guys. We don't... We're not, we're not trying to say that this is the end of the uptrend or anything like that. We're just trying to recognize resistance. So, Horace, a downside play from here is definitely feasible in my mind, but the broader story stays constructive. You're still, I mean, I don't think anyone's going to fight and say this is a bearish trend in dollar yen, right? But for the dollar index, for some of the other dollar crosses, the picture doesn't look so, so rosy for the dollar. Do you know what I mean? So you don't want to take a kind of static uh, bias versus one currency. You want to take each trade on, on its own merits. He says, okay, thanks. You're more than welcome. Um, so we kind of jumped around there a little, but that was dollar yen. Any questions on dollar yen before we move off? I just want to touch base. Number six uh, will be euro yen. We're actually making decent time. Um, and this is kind of just, I don't have very clear setup on what the near-term targets are if this does want to load at some point well that's weird ah. um, I don't have any setups on this or or any plays on this per se just yet but the, the game plan would would be to either fade a move into 123.47 or fade another drop um, into 119.30. So if you guys remember, actually, let me just bring up the report. Um, here's what this thing looked like back on the 7th. Right? We were heading into the ECB and we said, look, if it, if it spikes into 123.47, I'd like to fade that move. Basically, the same thing I just said right now is what we were looking to do. And that exactly what kind of exactly what happened. This thing rallied as high as uh, 123.35 before ducking lower. Didn't quite make it as low as 119. And here we are still in that same range, still below that critical region of resistance. This is the 618 retracement of the 2016 range. So just this year's price range. And it's also the 50 line for this current operative formation off the highs that we've been following. Looks like trading view is a little lagged here, um, but that, that extends to the high that you made in, what is that, 2013, December 2013 high? Both of those converge right there. So on a spike into that region, if you see failure, if you see some exhaustion, that would be a decent region to try to play the pullback. Otherwise, this is still a constructive trade. My bullish invalidation level is still 118.56, 118.46, so as long as price stays above that. Even if it spills that low, um, you know, I still think it's a buy. But some interesting levels here on Euro Yen. Uh, crude we did, Conwall. Silver uh, levels we haven't. Uh, crude levels we did it earlier in the session. Pretty in-depth. So we'll go over that again real quick if we have time at the end. But silver we'll cover. No worries.
questions on Euro Yen? Here's the near term chart looks like. Again, it's the same levels that are highlighted on the daily, so I didn't think it uh, necessary to kind of put that it would be kind of a redundant setup here, but just to keep things in view. Again, some decent divergence all into the highs. Could be a nice little near term ceiling to pop lower on. Inevitably on that drop down, you'd want to be looking to buy that for a recoil higher. Number seven, uh, let's do Kiwi CAD and then we'll jump into Kiwi. Was that for you, D? Someone wanted to cover Kiwi. Here's what Kiwi CAD looked like real quick from last night. Um, this is also another one. I actually, <laughs> I found this pretty funny because we first highlighted this chart, I'd said on the 17th of November, uh, this slope, and it's basically been the same exact slope in play. Um, it's been kind of like ping pong between these levels. So here's a four hour chart. You can see the sliding parallel here. Really nice pivots. Top side break. As I noted yesterday, we've been pivoting off of this region very nicely, uh, both from the resistance, or excuse me, from support and from resistance. If this was going to hold, you'd expect to stay below that. The fact that we broke above it yesterday, then sat on it into the close of US trade to the start of Asia trade still has me looking higher. Now, I wouldn't get too excited on the long side because you do have some major targets upcoming, namely the monthly open comes in at 95.15. Uh, more so, I'd be interested in a short exposure if we do get up into 95.60. Uh, that's a 38.2 retracement of the entire decline. More so, it's that same pivot line that has given us all these turns over the last four weeks. So that'd be a nice area of which if we do get that push higher, I'd be looking for some short exposure. Um, and guys, just continue to play that slope. I mean, it's been so fruitful. It's been pretty darn clear. So near-term risk is still for a drift higher here in Kiwi CAD. Um, inevitably, would be looking to get short near that 95.60 level if we get it. Questions on KiwiCAD? Amir, I appreciate your comments here, my friend. It's something we've been looking into. Um, and like I said earlier, actually, I think I noted this last week, guys, we are looking at some really interesting stuff. We're working with a company in the UK uh, to develop, um, you know, obviously we have coded indicators that we use on our end, guys, to help us identify what trades we want to be looking at for the day. Things we can't necessarily uh, give out, but we are going to be uh, creating some sort of signal process where that gives you guys an instant signal of, okay, there's a possible entry here on this trade, a possible entry here on this trades that we're looking at. So within the confines of the same setups that we talk about here on day in, day out, uh, something that will give you a little bit more of immediate time-sensitive entry. So Amir, we're on it. And I appreciate your comments, my friend. Cheers, mate. Definitely something, um, there's a lot of stuff in the pipeline, trust me. 2017 is going to be a big year for us, God willing. All right. So if there are no other questions here on KiwiCAD, uh, we will go ahead and move on to DollarCAD. KiwiCAD, still looking for this rally to give us a little bit more of a pop higher. Here's what DollarCAD looks like. And this is the only problem I have. I like dollar CAD, a nice spike lower, which is actually CAD strength, um, which kind of might curb the upside here. But the Kiwi's been ripping, so which is why for me this has still been on the menu, as it were, <laughs> for now. Uh, but oh, D, I will come to Kiwi first, as promised. I'm a man of my word. Uh, let's do Kiwi first, and then we'll do Kiwi CAD. Okay. <laughs> Here's New Zealand U.S. dollar. That's number eight. Number nine will be Kiwi. It will be Dollar Cad. Uh, so here's Kiwi Dollar. I uh, know that Jamie is uh, liking the long side, 7160 entry. Um, if you do get a dip, in, dip into that region, uh, might be a decent play. I agree with that. I'm not a big fan of Kiwi Dollar just because of the daily chart. Actually, the near-term chart too. But so <clears throat> you guys know we've been watching this ascending channel formation since the start of the year. Uh, the break below it saw a real clean test of that former channel support as resistance. Even on that spout on the 8th, where we kind of soared through that 100-day moving average and, and again pulled back, I still thought we could hold. 
I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what to do with that. Um, you know, you've made it back through the median line. You made it back through channel support. So for me, um, guys, I just honestly, I'm not going to even try to, uh, you know, I, I really don't have a very star, stern opinion on this, D. I think you want to stick with Jamie's interpretation um, for now. For me, I think, look, this is what it looks like on the intraday, okay? I could take an extension off the low here, and it gives me 100% a little bit higher. I can tell that just by looking at it. <laughs> there it is. It comes in right in line with that 618 um, of the same decline. So that gives you 7242, 7237 is near-term resistance. Uh, I don't have any near-term structural guidance on the advance, which is another reason I'm not a big fan of it. You know what I mean? This is what I could say. N near term necessarily, or near term, in my humble opinion, I'd be looking for exhaustion. I'd be looking for a pullback. Um, does that pullback base and find a new high or launch through this high to validate the break of this former channel support as resistance? Possibly. Look, at the end of the day, you made an outside day reversal off, you know, off a swing low. It wouldn't be necessarily something I would I would key as key support, but certainly it's been a decent pivot in price. Just looking at, you know, these former lows that we've made here. Um, so yeah, you made an outside day reversal off of near-term support. Uh, I just don't like the level you're coming into right now. Still think you're at risk. Uh, D, I wish I had more of a, a you know conviction bias for you on this, but <clears throat> you know usually if you don't see it on the intraday ch charts for a couple of days, uh, it's typically because I just don't have a very strong opinion on it at this point, and that's okay. Right, we have a lot of setups, a lot of various opportunities. Instead of sitting here trying to force a trade on this, um, you know, I kind of took a side seat for now. See how long this rally goes for. But it's interesting that that 618 of the decline actually converges right on that hundred. So if this is just a two equal legs up off the low, if it's just a correction, you know, this would be an area of which you'd start to look for some more rigid resistance. Um, on a pullback, look for 7186 as support. I know Jamie's got his entry in your 7160, um, so we'll have to see. You know, I'm not really a big fan of this trade right now. Personally, I just it looks messy to me too. Yeah, D. Yep. All right, so that's Kiwi Dollar. Now, can I move to Dollar Cat? <laughs> Here's what Dollar Cat looks like number nine. Um, I still think you get a stab, a stab lower here. Based on where we are in price, I love 130.80. If we can get a drop into that region, I do want to see some exhaustion. I want to see some signs of a turn in price. That's a 618 retracement. Here's the daily chart. Same levels uh, highlighted last week, same levels highlighted on Sunday. You're looking at a 618 retracement from the advance off the lows they made in August, but you're also looking at the 200-day moving average. You're looking at slope support, the lower median line parallel, all converge right there. So even the descending uh, median line formation of the operative immediate structure off the high, the lower parallel is there as well. Starts to get a little messy here as we get deeper in time, but this is basically where I'm looking for some, you know, some play in this thing right here. This is a four-hour chart. Here's a two-hour. And the closer in time you get, the only thing I want to highlight is super, super tight weekly opening range. You could see a scenario again, dollar spills, you get a drop into that region, quick jackknife. You'd need a break above 131.70 uh, to validate a more um, prominent reversal. Now, here's a breakaway gap, um, or here's a gap, I wouldn't even call this a breakaway gap per se, that again, you know, to fill that, 3169 would be the level to look for. It's exactly where we closed on Friday, if I'm not mistaken. 3169. Yep, 3169. So that's where I, that's how I like to use gaps, um, and especially when the gap level converges on structural resistance, structural support, a major key fib level, long-term moving averages. Uh, that's when the gap levels turn out to be really, really nice targets. 
in near term trading. Questions on dollar CAD? <clears throat> Looking for a drop near 13080 if I can get it for some exhaustion. If you break 13080, next downside target's not until 13010, 13025 down here. Okay, so you're likely to see a pretty stern drop beyond that. Again, keeping in mind where you are in the daily chart. So this is let's take you back a little bit. Basic trend line support off these lows. So it's quite a multi-year basic formation. Even within the confines of just this year, you have three tags. One, two, three. So pretty big region here for dollar cat as support. If you get a rally towards 3250, I think that's a good opportunity to get back on the short side, to be honest with you. Even ahead of that, 3230, this region here. Uh, this is a 38.2 retracement. This is of the entire 2016 range. No, I'm lying. This is from June, the June advance. Okay, pretty decent pivot in price, but more importantly, it's you know it's basically where the median line is. If I take this back into the intraday chart, 32.30 right here. So the 50 line of the current operative structure off the highs converges on this nice pivot in price. It's like 32.30 into 32.23. area of interest to get back on the short side possibly. All right, and that is dollar cad number nine. We got Kiwi for D, unemployment, that's Aussie, we'll go over that as well. Conwall, what about the gap of crude in the beginning of the week? So Conwall went over that gap, but we'll do it again in a moment, okay? I know we're running low on time here. Uh, let me go over Aussie dollar real quick, and then we'll jump into the commodities. Guys, here's what Aussie looks like. Keep in mind, Aussie data, uh, we do have Aussie unemployment numbers on tap tomorrow night, so do keep that in mind. It's charged some pretty decent volatility over the years. Um, here's what the Aussie trade looks like. As I noted yesterday, and I was like, I remember I was laughing at myself at, during the webinar because, well, A, the sound kept on cutting off, but B, <laughs> uh, 75 did give out. And it looks like it finally just happened. So as I noted yesterday, and as I was told, you know, I put this in Sunday's update as well. I've been taking shorts off 75 for like three weeks, and it's been pretty fruitful. But starting into the or heading into the open of this week, I told you guys to be a little bit more reserved with that because each bounce and subsequent push off 75 has offered less of a drop. Momentum has started to hold more rigidly above the 50 level on the intraday chart, specifically on the hourly. And it just looked like it was, you know, wanted to see a little bit of attempt to push higher. I'm not necessarily interested in the long side still. Uh, I know that we're holding longs on the swing side of trades, guys. You guys are looking for the swings. You're looking for uh, targets near 75.44, uh, which is the next upside target that we have on the scalp chart here and the 50% retracement of the decline. I'd be interested in possible short exposure if you get near 76. I know that's a level that we've talked about for a while here. Just as a quick reminder, talking about the 100-day moving average, uh, 7580 is a 1618 off the low. 76 is the 618 off the low. And of course, you have that buy sector there, that 50 line converging right along that level. So kind of a big region. I guess the underbelly of that starts near 7580, um, but sort of a region of which if we do get a rally into um, certainly for me would be an area of interest for possible shorts. If you're on the long side um, and you take some off at 75.45, bring your stops to break even, play a more defensive stance, see if you can get that stretch heading into 75.80, 76. I'd be looking to carve off the rest of that trade. Also note basic trend line support, support, break, instant resistance. That converges on that level two heading into the FOMC. All right, we'll see where this is heading. We'll see what this looks like heading into tomorrow. It's uh, certainly going to be one of my favorite plays. Questions on Aussie? That is number 10. Okay, um, let's take a look at the commodity block. Here's what silver looks like. Um, 
Conwell says, thank you, sir, for yesterday. You wrote the levels on the board. That helped me a lot. Hey, you're more than welcome. And again, I apologize for anyone who joined us. Um, there was an issue there with Daily Effects's gear. I'm not really sure what's up with that, but they're aware of it. Uh, anyway, here's what uh, Silver looks like. You know, Conwell, I don't really have anything new to add beyond that. Remember that median line formation we added a couple of weeks ago? It's still in play, believe it or not. Um, I mean, you're basically still holding the same range. The upper parallel still continues to highlight a region just above 1740, 1739. It's key resistance. Near-term support, still that same region that we talked about last week. Sixteen ninety four. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think you look for the upswing here still. Your monthly open comes in at 1685. So you know what? I do want to highlight that. I'm going to get out of this 100%. I do want to highlight the monthly open. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. The uh, That was last week's open. I'm sorry about that, guys. That's not the monthly open. Here's this week's open. That's what I want to highlight is near-term support. Now, I know that's kind of far from structural support on this median line formation here, but um, that gives you like 1683. Key resistance, still 1740 or just thereabouts. All the commodities are going to do this thing ahead of this release, okay? Because if you do get a really stern reaction, I hate to be the one to be like, oh, well, if the dollar rallies, then commodities need to soften. It's not necessarily always the case. But specifically on this release, yeah, if interest rate expectations dwindle, the dollar comes off, that gives rise to gold inherently, right? Stronger interest rate expectations will tend to weigh on gold prices and vice versa. So in the case where they start to snuff out expectations for further rates, that'll likely be a real strong headwind, uh, you know, tailwind rather for gold um, on both parts. Um, and that could give you know, the rise to, to prices. Same thing here in silver. I think if you see a real dramatic pullback in the dollar, that could give us the spike we we're looking for into 1740. Um, and then look for a little bit more of a key resistance level there. This is still critical, real critical for, for silver prices. Here's gold. Um, for gold prices, look, the near-term chart is super messy. I've tried to work this like every which way last week, if you guys remember. Um, the only thing I like on this is the daily. And the only thing I want to see is two levels of key support or key levels of interest, let's call it for me, um, that's 11.42 and 11.20 slash 30, this region. You probably heard me talk about it for months and months and months. It's going to be part of the quarterly forecasts on daily effects. It's going to be part of the uh, trades of the year. This is a big region, okay? You got the 1618 extension off the high, 764 retracement uh, from the advance off the lows. You have the 2014 swing lows, which come into that region as well. Um, you know, even the slope of the decline off the highs, very clean, very, very tidy, right? All of these formations, all these slopes have seen some very nice pivots in price. Lower parallel also converges on that region, 1120, 1130. Key support in gold. In the meantime, Conwall, um, you know, just keep in mind, you're heading into a major event risk. And I, the only reason I try to hammer that, guys, if, if you're sick of hearing me say it, is because I just want you to be on the defensive. I hate to see, we, we talk about such near-term price action here that, you know, FOMC comes out, you get a 50 pip swing, you know, now all of a sudden you kind of stop down four different positions because you were playing it too tight or your leverage was too high or anything of the like. So I always try to give you more of a cautionary stance. Look, 
momentum, yeah, it's not really all that convincing here, right? That's yeah, kind of like pitiful. Still bearish. It's not very, doesn't suggest a very strong downside swing right now. So I like it lower. I think even if it spikes higher all the way into the highs from last week, essentially, I'd still be looking to sell that for a drop into 1130, 1120. If it gets through 1203, I'm bullish again, period. End of conversation, full stop. Okay. Eileen says, so after the Fed stuff tomorrow, you'll be watching what other besides Aussie dollar? So after the Fed stuff tomorrow, definitely sterling dollar, Eileen, because you have the unemployment numbers and BOE um, from the UK. Uh, certainly dollar yen is something I'll be, I'll be watching into the end of the year. Dollar yen is probably going to be one of the biggest movers. Let me ask you a quick question, guys. If I were to ask you right now, what's the strongest performer so far this year? What currency would you guys guess? Eileen says yen. I mean, just throw out your guesses. Horace also agrees the yen. Adam says the euro. Conwell says the Aussie. Good guesses, good guesses. I hate to break it, but you're all wrong. You know what the best performer has been so far? CAD, believe it or not. Yes, Amir got it. My man. I asked that question yesterday on the trade desk. No one gave me the right answer. I was just snuffing through some research and going through. Um, and I literally went around the entire trade desk and no one guessed it. They all had the same exact questions you did. Yeah. Uh, generally speaking, performance base versus all the uh, all of its currencies. Believe it or not, CAD is actually one of the top performers. So, um, I don't know. That's just a little tidbit I threw out there for you guys <laughs> throughout. But uh, to answer your question, Eileen, that's definitely something I'll be looking at uh, heading into uh, post post FOMC, um, specifically on the in, in the in the case of a stronger dollar story. Okay, if the dollar does rally. You know, I'd want to see a, a drift, a spike, an attempt into 130.80 to get long. I think that's going to be a decent position. Um, you know, guys, for me, a 130.80 into 132.50 or 132.30, that's a big trade. You know, that's not something you typically that you would call an intraday per se, but um, see that there, guys? Damn, I just eyed that out. Where was that earlier? Ew. All right. So <laughs> support, support, messy, 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 support, same area. That's interesting. Um, but that's something I'll definitely be paying attention to, Eileen. Again, tomorrow we'll go over all the dollar crosses, guys. Uh, Conwall, I hope you got your, your um, levels. Again, here's crude real quick before I close out this session. He's saying, what about the gap in crude at the beginning of the week? Um, and your words always come true. Conwell, well, cheers, mate. No, it's not. Again, they're not my levels, man. I'm just helping you find them. They're the market's levels. Uh, here's crude. I still think you do risk a move lower, okay, towards, um, well, essentially, to fill the breakaway. That would require a move back into this region here, the gap, right? Gapped right into this region. I'm not sure why sometimes these gaps show. Sometimes they do not. Anyway, um, I still think you, you risk going more of a, of a near-term pullback into this region. This is where we gapped from, key area of resistance. And again, right now it's the lower median line parallel as well. So just keep that in mind. Um, index on the squawk after the webinar, if you don't mind. Um, I know you're tight on time right now. Amir, which index are you looking for? Oh, the S&P and the Dow. Let's take a quick look. Let's take a quick, quick look. Then I do have to run. Uh, here's the S&P 500. I don't think I have any near-term levels, actually. So here's the problem with, with these types of trades. Um, you know, part of the stuff that we do here, uh, Amir, is to find previous price action so that we can identify targets in price 
areas that market may have found resistance or support. Once you start probing into all-term record highs, I never really get involved in intraday positioning on those trades. Um, on a, specifically on a counter trend, specifically on a counter trend. I mean, I can help try to help you find where a pullback might find some support to get back on the long side. But where you want to short this, you're you know you're in uncharted territory essentially. Um, so you know, let me let me play with this a little bit, uh, Amir. We'll see if I have something for you tomorrow. I mean, every time I've tried to even ascertain any type of near term targets, this thing is kind of just uh, ran right through them. So let me see what I can do for you on the Dow and the S&P, but both of them, I can tell you, uh, from a near-term prospect, trying to fade those, you would need the market to turn first, make an attempted test of that high, then turn lower, and then you'd have some sort of near-term price action from which to base your opinion upon. Uh, but just trying to find where I want to short on this rally, I can't even tell you with any type of conviction, nor would I want to try on where you want to fade this. All right, Amir, so we'll take another look at it tomorrow, again, with another update on all the dollar crosses ahead of the FOMC. Till then, best of luck trading, guys. Uh, keep in mind, the midweek strategy webinar also got pushed back, obviously, till Thursday to give us room for the FOMC interest rate decision. So we'll do a quick preview on that tomorrow, and we'll see you then. Best of luck trading. Cheers.